Makes It 29 is an extensive and extremely detailed interview with a girl called Nina from up north in Yorkshire. Nina has been in a sub-project of one of the MK Ultra programs in England. She's gained access and been in the Men With Hill secret NSA facility in Yorkshire. Here we present her testimony in three parts. Part one, simply who is Nina, her background and some of her family and her history, which has got vitally important connections with many important individuals in this story. She also gives a damning and deep analysis of attacks on myself and the Amash project. This results in a damning indictment of the person who created the project and is declared as extremely dangerous. I make no bones about this, this is her testimony and the testimony of several other individuals have come to me individually. We cover this at the end of part one and the start of part two and a separate YouTube version follows. In part two we discuss some of her aspects in the program and in part three we discuss her connection with the super soldiers. So, bases 29 with Nina, a super soldier and spiritual warrior. Okay, Nina, welcome to Bases 29. It's really good to see you. Uh, and you. And we are in Yorkshire. That's, as I said, with a stupid English. So good English. Miles keeps copying my accent. No, and uh, badly. And, <laughs> no, um, you did it quite good, actually. Uh, we, we are in Bradford. No, we're in Bingley. Well, yeah, we're actually the opposite side of Ilkley Moor. Oh, you prefer to call it what? Well, I'm, I'm not from here. Uh, what am I saying? Why am I even saying Well, we're from? in Bingley. We're, we're in Bingley, which is the opposite side of Ilkley Moor. I only mention that because Ilkley Moor has like, so much relevance to... Ilkley Moor. Yeah. Ilkley Moor is like, really famous. Yes. So um, why have you contacted the Basis series? Under what context do you enter this story? Um, because it's my belief that I am bloodline. Um, my, on both sides of my family, um, my grandfather was Scottish and he um, was a founder member of the Scottish National Party. He was also a psychiatrist that had like con control over Yorkshire and Humberside for his whole career, which spanned from about the 1930s up until the peak of his career, would have been up until about 19, late 1970s. So he ran a mental hospital. He also, um, he also did prison psychiatry where he would go and um, assess murderers, etc., state of mind. Um, so he, yeah, oh God. Oh, and he also set up like this group where all these psychiatrists would meet monthly, I think it was, to swap case notes and like discuss like what was that called uh was it a name yeah that's a very good question um oh and he was really involved with alcoholics anonymous as well because like that that he he helped form that in great britain because it was american initially he um before he fully qualified he or maybe he had qualified i don't know but he did work for a year at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Now you're talking the real Baltimore, not the one in the United States, obviously. Yeah, no, I'm talking about no, I'm talking about in Maryland in America. Oh, you're talking. Right, yeah, okay. which is and now that's um, is I definitely. I take all that back. Um, you know, I should really have picked up my notebook and it's upstairs because with relevance to him. It's all just written already in there. Okay, well, let's just uh, unplug and go and get it then. Yeah. It worked on a... She was a dancer for bands, which were travelling around Germany and um, Turkey, and it doesn't, really, well, it doesn't really matter where they were. The point is that they were American bases. They were performing at the whole time. 
Okay. Okay, Nina, you were talking about your grandfather, and yes. you wanted to get the precise name of certain things. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, said just your grandfather was a genius. Yeah, he was a genius. Yeah. Okay. And you're you're talking about him in the United States. Yeah, 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 him. yeah. But we could. Well, I mean, we could. Yeah, I could have. Yeah. Okay, we'll go back to that. Well, first off, he was born in 1907. I'll just mention that randomly now. Um, so he was in Baltimore in 1933. So he would have been qualified then. Is your father, he, is your grandfather English or American? My grandfather was Scottish. He was found a member of the Scottish National Party. Um, Represented Glasgow in inter-university inter de debates. Um, he was a socialist, and himself and his like best friend became the founder members of the Scottish National Party. Um, I can't think what his name was though right now. In 1929, he qualified for first-class honours and proxy. Assess it for Macintosh Prize in Psychological Medicine. Psychiatrist, basically. On graduating, he... He worked for a while at... Oh, that really famous one in London. Now, hang on, I think... I think... Sorry, OK. So, yeah, he, he, did, he went to America in 1932, to Baltimore which is where he spent a year working at John Hopkins University and Hospital. Came back to uh, Scotland in 1933. I just want to mention, though, that the John Hopkins um, Hospital in Baltimore is the place which is quite famous for the false memory syndrome. Um, for the, Yeah, false memory syndrome. Uh, like... They have a huge part to play in that, and they are a programming sensor. What do you mean by false memory? Are you talking about some kind I'm of I'm talking control? about um, people who have recovered memories of like buried memories from like ritual abuse or from programming like MK Ultra, and the false memory syndrome was set up to discredit them for their memories and say that they've made it all up. So you're saying your grandfather was involved with... I'm not saying that he was involved with that, but I'm saying the place he worked was involved with that. And yes, he was a psychiatrist. He was involved with mind control. So that brings your grandfather straight into the picture of mind control, which brings your, your frame of reference right into the basis series. Yeah. Yeah. What about your grandmother? Oh, I actually have a picture of her here. My grandmother was meant to be an actress. She was really beautiful. Uh, <laughs> she was called Nina as well. Any special name? Any, uh, did you have an actress name? What sort of? Well, her original name wasn't Nina. She changed her name to Nina. She never actually became an actress because the war broke out and so she got married instead to my grandfather. Um, but I'm just wondering, well, I mean, obviously Were there was there loads of tension before. Sorry, go on. There was detention? Tension with the countries before the war broke out. I mean, it didn't just happen overnight, did it? I mean, so the what's new... Your, what native of which country? Oh, right, she's, she, she was English. And... Grandfather, grandfather Scottish, but um, with links to Italy because related to Rossini. Um, I'm just not quite sure how many generations back. I think it, I think he would be my fourth or fifth great grandfather. Why should be? Why should be the uh, relations be tense between countries? Ten. Oh, I mean, she was meant to be an actress, and she was meant. She was. She was designed. Create. Not, she was trained to be come an actress in Hollywood. She was meant to be like one of the next big things. What do you mean created? Well, I mean, pro pro probably programmed to do that, I would imagine. How, what do you mean your grandmother was probably programmed? Well, I don't know. I mean... But why I'm do you say that? I say that because everyone in Hollywood is programmed. So you don't become an actress in Hollywood by accident. 
So, <laughs> how do you mean they are programmed? How do you mean? How what do, do you know I define that? that? Um, I mean that people are certain people are born and their lives are pre-planned by their families. By how do you explain something so vast in a few sentences? People who are watching this will know this because if people are watching this, then they've researched this anyway. Well, for those who don't know, <laughs> then research MK Ultra and Hollywood. At what time are you talking? Are you talking about before the war? Yeah, well, well, people people have the misconception that that mind control was brought over by Project Paperclip and started with the Nazis. That's absolutely ridiculous. Mind control has always, always, always existed. It's just it became more of a and the the whole overall agenda was sp sped up then. And well, Kathy Morgan's work says it was alive and well in, the, yeah, in England definitely. in the 1800s. Yeah, for sure, 100%. Abs absolutely. But a lot of people like to think that... Because a lot of people can only seem to reference back as far as Project Paperclip, and they just seem to think that that's when it all began. And I mean, it's, religion is a massive... For, can be used as a form of control. I mean, some people have suggested that uh, Project Cape Paperclip, uh, the Americans got the rocket scientists and the German and the um, uh, the Russians got the rocket scientists, but Britain got the psychiatrists and the yeah. non-human entities. Yeah, I would agree. What about that? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, you would agree that Britain got the non-human entities. I think non-human entities are all over the place. So what do you mean by non-human entity? I mean interdimensional beings. From where and what do they do? What sort of scale of operation are we talking about? To me it's all about spiritual warfare, um, really. And what do you mean by spiritual warfare, really? Forces of good and evil. Um, right and wrong, yin and yang, oh my god. It, I mean, one man's <laughs> evil is a man and another man's uh, good. Well, I wouldn't say, it's not mean? as simple as that, is it? You know, yes. everything's relative and everything's so multi-layered and diverse. It's not simple if it was so simple. Well, maybe it, on one level it is, but on another level it's so complicated. Um, but to me, my whole life has felt to me like it has been about... Well, I just really can feel this like spiritual warfare going on all around all the time. It's I, it's a basically it, basically it's a war for souls, in my opinion. A war for souls. Yeah, yeah. And what? Who wins? If you which side wins? Where do the what happens to the souls? Well, which side wins? That depends what choices people make, doesn't it? And what? Is the soul? What is the soul? We are also we are the soul. We're in the, we're in our bodies now, but we are all souls. The question is, are we all souls? Some this, of these people are. That's what I was going to say. The question too. is, have we hung on to our souls, or have we sold out? A lot of people are soulless these days, brainwashed, soulless. However you want to describe it, there's many, many, many bodies which don't have souls. How would one determine whether somebody has a soul or not? Empathy, love, compassion, connection to source, all of the things which are beautiful and natural in life. If you haven't got a soul, then... You're soulless. <laughs> Where has your soul gone? Well, good question. Good question. Has it gone to hell? Gone to the fourth dimension? What? What do you mean? I don't know. I don't, I haven't answered. I think it's a good question. Um, I, I can't answer all this stuff. I mean, I. I mean, for instance, British Telecom has a thing called the Soul Catcher. They yeah, were, they were boasting about that. Open University, BBC, um, way back in 1999, I think. And obviously, this has moved on a great deal. 
further and they're talking about soul capture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, obviously. What like, do you think that that relates to? Well, yeah, we know that souls can be trapped, caught, take, taken. Um, and souls can be transferred. The technology exists for all this. It's just obviously How do you hidden. Know that? I don't know, but I do know. Have you know. experienced it? Have you seen it happen? No, not if I, if I have, um, then I haven't got a recollection of seeing it happen, but I, I know that it can happen. And how do you know? Did you read it somewhere in the back of a comic book? Or yeah, that's right. I just read comics all day long. Or Th did that's you where experience I get... it uh, in a base somewhere? Or I don't somewhere? know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So well, some... let's get back to your, to your grandparents. Yeah. They seem to be very, very important in this. Okay, so... You're talking about your grandmother being an actress, but well, not yeah, being an actress. Yeah, I mean, she, she never... Let's see what year they married, because that might... Just one moment. 1939, they married. So, obviously, by then, they knew that the war was going to happen. What is... What, yeah. But they married here... They had a world, whirlwind romance. They what sort of whirlwind romance? As we had in, a bit too much of that on the basis series. <laughs> as in, they met and they were married within. Oh God, about. I don't know. I think it was within three months or something. It doesn't say. Uh, anyway, first sight. they married in the, in 1939. Ah. Uh, had three children. My grandmother was uh, Rh negative blood. That seems to be a common factor in this business. Yeah, yeah. How important is it then? Do we know that you can't give blood? They won't allow it. What? There's any Me? connection with that? Me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tried to give blood when I was about sixteen, seventeen, um, but I do have a thing called beta thalassemia trait, which is a gene carrying beta thalassemia, which is a bit like sickle cell. Um, which is why they said that they wouldn't accept my blood. But you don't know your blood type? I cannot find my blood type out. I've tr uh, well, I mean, I probably could get a kit or something and test myself, but I did ask my doctor um, for because obviously it's going to be on my medical records, everyone gets tested. And um, he uh, said that if I wanted to find out my blood type, I would have to um, get pregnant or have children. Um, this is only recently um, when I was not, well, it would have been within the last 12 months. Um, and I said, that, well, he repeated it like three times to me. <laughs> it was being deadly serious. How did he look at you when he said that? Um, seriously, really seriously. Because I just started laughing. I'm like, yeah, I'm really going to have children just so I can find out what blood type I am. That's insane. Absolute insanity. But he was being deadly serious. It was very bizarre. I think... I, I, yeah, and yeah, okay, never mind. Okay, back to the grandparents. What have, uh, you, You've now got parents, and you've... Mm -hmm. uh, or you, have you, when have you been born? Huh? What about the family? Well, I'll just say one thing, the whole thing about my grandfather. He was, um, he ran a hospital. Um, he was the, it was called then, medical superintendent um, for a hospital. Is this your grandfather on the floor there or something? Oh, yeah, sorry. You want to see? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Here you are. That's my grandfather. Yeah. And actually, there's a picture behind you of my granny and grandpa together. If you really wanted it on camera, I, you could pass me it. Maybe later we'll do that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, okay. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say that... Cut became consultant psychiatrist in 1939. He was also the honorary consultant psychiatrist at Leeds General Infirmary, Keithley and District, Victoria Hospital and Oak Bank Hospital for Maladjusted Boys. 
What kind of manager does she I play? don't know. I presume um, naughty, but you know, quote unquote, disturbed children, boys, males. Um, <sighs> Do you have any further information on what they mean they were disturbed by? I don't know. Not really. Um, but the hospital which he ran um, also had like a children, adoles- an adolescent unit for people with eating, um, I can't think, with, um, yeah, eating problems, um, like bulimia and anorexia. These are kids, these are your male kids? With- no, that these were, they, this was, a girl, well, I presume this particular place was, I don't know, if, I think, don't think it was mixed, I think it was girls. So what I'm trying to say basically is, that my grandfather, he also, he also did criminal cases where he interviewed murderers and assessed the mental health, of, et cetera. And so, basically, he had control of the whole entire mental health in Yorkshire and Humberside for at least 50 years, a long time, from the 19, mid 19 mid to late 1930s, definitely, definitely, definitely to the late 70s. But he never, ever retired. He still had patients coming to his home. You want to see his home? <laughs> this is the home which, he, well, this, this isn't the one connected to the hospital, but that's why he, it's not the best picture, but anyway. It was an interesting home because it had two balconies which were like a castle, a castle like, tight walls on it. It was cool, but you can't see in this picture. Oh, and here is the mug from the National Scottish National Party, but I don't think it'll pick up. He's called James as well, my grandfather, which is a key name, isn't it? For people involved in mind control projects and stuff. My hand's shaking. <laughs> I'm not that's nervous fine. at all. That's, that's okay. Can okay, I move this now? Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't think there's anything else as well. Oh, there's a picture of me here, which is kind of interesting. While we're doing pictures, and then we'll just cut that. But it's just, I think I'm quite brainwashed here um, from the point of view that at this moment in time, I'm still following like exactly what oh, I'm meant to be doing. The other way, so that the flare is a bit. Which way? Other way, other way. Reverse that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still behaving like I was meant to be behaving at the time that this picture was taken. Yeah, what do you mean? What do you mean you were still behaving the way you were meant to be behaving? Well, I had a really controlling family, and I was meant to behave. Well, I was meant to do what I was told. I mean, and I, I know obviously that's like sounds so ridiculous because aren't all children meant to do what they're told? But I'm like seventeen here. Yeah. I think. And I'm still, I'm still following the programme. I'm still doing... I'm still... Before I was ever able to do anything, I had to go and run everything by Grandpa first. And I could only do it if he agreed that it was a good idea. So that was just before I went to a pair in Germany. And there was a few different families that I applied for jobs with. But they had to be okayed by him. I distinctly remember he spoke to them by telephone before and so the family I went to work for were two doctors she was a GP but she 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 was a GP he was a professor of medicine dentistry and um psychology he was he was like a super genius I have like my grandfather. Now, you, you, you've implied that there's something sinister about this control. Why? Because um, I realised later it, it's not normal to have that level of control in your life. I didn't know that at the time because it, it's all I'd ever really known. You know, you get brought up by your families and it's normal, isn't it? So, it was only like a bit later that I, I always knew something was wrong and I always knew that whatever they were doing wasn't working because there was never such a thing as unconditional love in my family. It was always conditioned love. So 
It's hard for me to talk about this because I really, really, really... My grandfather was like my father. It's sort of a lot of families had this kind of thing, a sort of Victorian thing. Men couldn't have feelings. Do you think that's yeah, well, just no, sort of relatively I mean, normal? Uh, no, my grandfather was like, everyone like was totally in love with him. And he was like, it's also contradictory in terms because everyone like, it reminds me of like the whole thing with um, Mengele from the point of view that the whole like love-hate type thing. Um, like everyone, even like people that were really badly abused by him still loved him and thought he was like a great man. And that's what it was like with my grandfather. Um, Is this how you brought the German connection in? Like no, I brought the German connection in because I just thought it was really interesting. Like when I found out, well, it, um, I was living right by Nuremberg at a place called Erlangen. This would be about 1997, I think. Um, I was meant to stay for a year, but I didn't, I stayed for about three months in the end. Cause, uh, and you were being an au pair? I was an au pair for, a, so for this you. family. They had three children, um, three years old, six years old, and nine years and that. Two little boys, three years old, six years old, and a little girl who was nine years old. <laughs> I know, three children, three years between. And what were the children like? Uh, a bit messed up, oh, very, pretty messed up. They had a different au pair, like, every year, their whole lives, they were pretty disassociated the little boy I'm really connected with um he got all the blame in the family and so I really yeah they were they were sweet kids but they were pretty messed up I mean he he just got he was a bad guy or yeah he was always the one that was getting screamed at and blamed for everything um the little girl was like the angel and she was a lovely kid, and she was a lovely kid, but I mean, she was the one who was treated like an angel. Her mother, though, massively relied on her. Her mother, the mother couldn't cope. Um, they lived in this, like, apartment, even though... Because he kept spending all the money on doing these courses to further... He was a genius. He, he, he kept going on these Harvard, Harvard courses. University. Harvard, Harvard? America. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, she, she used to burst into tears and, and sometimes and break down and cry and tell me all this stuff. Um, she expected to be like, like living in a mansion and this, that and the other because, but he kept spending all their money doing these mad courses and stuff. Um, really dysfunctional what do you mean family. By mad courses? Well, I don't, I mean, from her perspective, that's how she viewed it. Um, he, was, he was crazy in an eccentric, genius type way. Uh, would have looked like a typical German guy, I suppose. We were in Bavaria, I mean, so... What, was anything sinister? Why, why just a rich family had au pairs? Um, we we used to go to... The thing which I found a bit sinister at the time... I didn't live in their house. I lived at, just around the corner to them. Um, more its location in, in some... There's key things about this. So without getting too sidetracked... I was living in Erlangen, which is right next to Nuremberg, which is where Hitler started his... I think the first time he was massively... I can't think what it was called, the exact name of the speech he did there. Um, Reichstag or something. That was, the Reichstag. The, that, yeah, that I'm sure. I'm sure I might, that might be wrong, but anyway. But why the connection? Why should that be sinister? This is all no, no, because, long hang on, after I'm the getting war. there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Um, so... So that was really, well, I found at the time, I thought it was really interesting at the time because I, because I went around all these places and I could see, like, from the German perspective, like, what had happened. And they had pictures everywhere of where, like, we'd bombed them and where they'd rebuilt the, we'd, literally, the place had been obliterated. All the churches, everything had been obliterated and they'd rebuilt it all back to how it originally was. It was just... Oh, so they totally rebuilt the original buildings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and they had the pictures of all these things going through all the different stages. It was so fascinating. Um, uh, yeah. But the family I was working for were from Munich. So we regularly went to visit her family there. Now, that was quite... Um, they were... They were quite... Yeah, they were really... I don't even know the word for it. They were quite weird. Um... Can you speak German? 
Not very well. <laughs> I mean, is that the point, was to teach them English? Yeah, I was meant to be learning German. Like, I was under there for a year, and kids, to help the kids English, and I was doing German classes whilst I was there. I can speak more German than I can French. I did French at school for, like, GCSEs, and I didn't learn German at school. And I can actually speak more German than French, which is kind of a bit crazy. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> the reason I keep meant right so yeah. I found out that Bavaria which is where I that's the area that I was in Germany is a key place to do with mind control and that is why it's relevant to me and my story and of course you know there is the okay, whole okay that's a key place for mind control yeah uh, why should you be associated with that I mean okay you know, you fly over Hiroshima, that doesn't mean that you've been involved with... Well, when your grandfather was running the mental health for uh, the whole of pretty much the north of England, and your grandmother was meant to become a Hollywood actress, um, and when your mother... When his three children were brought up to become key things... Key, what do you mean, key things? His eldest firstborn was sent to boarding school to become a doctor. That was the plan. He stuck to it. Became The only thing which he didn't do to script was he was meant to become a surgeon, but he got his girlfriend pregnant, so they got married. And so he had to become a GP instead because they would have had to carry on training for longer to be a surgeon. So, yeah, but became a, G- a GP who was famous for being, for being brilliant with children in North Yorkshire. So that's my eldest uncle. So the firstborn son. <laughs> um, then there's... So, yeah, then there's the secondborn who... Well, I don't really know what... But, right, my grandmother was Irish negative. Grandpa was positive. So the firstborn got away with this, no health implications. The secondborn was like a weak, sickly child. He had polio. So he didn't have to go to boarding school. His life plan was changed accordingly because... So he was allowed to stay at home. Um, he went to private school, but he was allowed to stay at home. He didn't have to go to boarding school. Um, and then my mother was born, who had massive... She, she, as soon as she was born, she had to have a blood transfusion, except up until this point in time, no one had survived. No newborn babies had survived having a blood transfusion. So she did actually survive. Was she one of the first? She was the first. So they got that technique to work? Yeah. She's not on record as being the first because someone a week later was born who was on record. Uh, and, but, she, but she was the first. So, well, that's what I've been told my whole life by my family. And they're medical, like a lot of people. I've got three generations of doctors from my grandfather's side. Him, his son, his first... Him, his firstborn, and then his firstborn son's firstborn was also, he became a consultant, an assistant at the young, youngest person to become one at his age in the country, to get so far up so quickly in the country. So, yeah. And I was because, that because of sheer talent or any assisted... Well, they are geniuses, to... you know, so I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. I really don't know uh, what you just asked me. Obviously connected, aren't they, in some ways, shapes and forms. But I, 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 I don't know. I mean, uh, some people would just say they're just very clever people and they've done very well in their yeah. profession. Yeah, and maybe that's it. Maybe maybe that's the case. But we do know that if you are abducted, you you end up going to your immediately sectioned or you're, you're sent there if they find out or they want to do things with you. Is that got any connection? It's, sorry, if you're abducted... Sections. What is, say, uh, sorry, well, if you're as, an abductee, yeah, yeah, an alien, yeah. so-called, a so-called yeah, yeah, alien yeah, abductee, yeah. they yeah. section you. They section you. Yeah. Yeah. Policy. You mean if you were to go to your, your doctor and tell your doctor all this, then you get sectioned. Yeah. Is that true? Is that true? Um, 
My grandfather wouldn't speak to me about stuff like that. Um, Have you gra- asked him about that? Um, well, I used to always go on about spirituality and stuff. And, what um, do you mean spirituality and stuff? Well, they were atheists. They didn't believe in anything. Or well, that's what they always told me. But I, I think they hid a lot from me. Is that because a lot of people consider so-called Christianity to be a mind virus and therefore a form of programming? Well, he, it was. Well, yeah, of course, you know, it can be, can't it? But um, I mean, they wouldn't anything supernatural. They denied existed, is what I mean. So it's all just what you can see in the here and now. That is all that they would admit existed, and seeing it all from a scientific point of view and not any kind of soul connection that was meant to be dead. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't admit it, admit it existed. So but there has been medical studies in that regard at universities. And, and yeah, well, for a genius, he wasn't very clever when it came to that side of things. No, I don't mean that. What I mean is, I was not meant to believe in all this stuff because, um, I don't know why, because I wasn't meant to. I was meant to believe in what I can see here, all around, you know, just just like everything I'm meant to just be like a really conservative person who trains to become a doctor or vet that is what I was meant to be from a young age that's what they expected me to become but I knew that money didn't make you, couldn't make you happy and I knew that what they wanted for me I knew what, the, what they had didn't bring happiness and so all I could ever do was go against what they were trying to make me do because I felt if they don't know how to be happy how can they possibly know how to make me happy so So, you became a bit rebellious yeah everybody else has fitted the plan but you didn't Um, I think my mother might have thought she was being rebellious because she um, she became a go-go dancer, they were called, go-go girl or something. She was a dancer, basically, for singers, for bands. Uh, her okay. best friend. Well, what do you mean by a dancer? Da- you know, like a backing dancer for... Uh, no, not anything, not anything like dodgy, like stripping or anything. I mean, well, not in public anyway. But the point which I'm getting to with this is that she was a backing dancer for bands and they travelled around Germany, Turkey, Greece, uh, the three main countries but they were working on American bases, performing there. That is what they were doing. They weren't just performing anywhere, always American bases. You have a, a band name or anything? Um, yeah, there was, the most famous one would be The Chants. The Chants, C-H-A-N-T-S. There is YouTube links um, with their stuff up. Black bands, they, they were all Afri- African descent. So what did that... Um entail I mean you, uh, they did just provide us some social entertainment on the American yeah, basis but, yeah there's really anything to be concerned about there well I think that my mother um, will have been, had like monarch programming um, you're saying your mother was monarch yeah I think so what gives you that impression well she's very very disassociated she switches personalities like all the time she doesn't remember stuff which I can clearly remember um, and also like stuff that happened when I was a kid if you were to read Fritz Springmeier's book or any of his books um, about programming mind control programming all of the key events which would happen in a child's life happened to me in my life and when you've been mind controlled you also programmed to pass it on. It's generational, isn't it? So, so how do you know that, and why do you say it? I mean, if you're programmed, are you saying you are? Mom? I think that I think that um, that I have been programmed, but I think that I've started to break that programming. I think I fought it all the way, to be honest. I don't think I would have been easy to program because I always managed to stay in touch with my like God connection all my life, right from. from being in a family with atheists 
I, I took myself off down to some neighbours down the road and started to go to church with them as a tiny child. I was like four years old. Um, I think I managed. To, I think I always managed to stay connected to the faith you, in more. Are you saying your parents didn't realize, didn't know that was happening? No, uh, they knew that I was doing it. It wasn't a secret. Um, but my mom. How, how do you establish that your mother was monarch and you are not? I'm, well, I'm. I'm not saying necessarily that I am now, but I believe that the intention was that. Yeah, mind controlled. I don't. I don't know. What, I used to be obsessed with bluebirds. Um, I used to draw them all the time, and of course, I find out that that's like a project, mind control project. Bluebirds. Yeah, I used to draw them all the time. Like when I was a kid, I just non-stop drew, used to draw them all the time. Like there's a picture in there, which I used to be quite obsessed with. Um, and I was looking at that yesterday, and I was thinking. Is bluebird a particular Not type? like, um, I just mean like these blue birds, but Max Spears has got a bluebird tattoo on his arm, which he doesn't really remember getting. It's just like a symbol of mind control from certain programs. Um, and Now you've mentioned Max Spears, now we're, you've, we're now talking essentially 2013 and super soldiers. How does that work out? How does that connect? When I was brought up near Menrith Hill, and I've always felt really quite connected to that. Um, so. Why have you always felt that? I don't, I, well, I didn't know. I just always had this like, and I, there's a few things which I've always had in within me my whole life. Um, one of them was an awareness of secret societies. Um, Such as? Freemasons, the occult. Witchcraft, I suppose. Always been interested in these things which were hidden um, all my life. I can't ever remember not being a bit obsessed with finding out about the hidden things. Um, or even if I wasn't, well, as a young child, obviously, I, I mean, I wasn't, but I saw things like I'd be riding on the moors, on Ilkley Moor, and I, like one Midsummer's Eve, and um, I don't know, some rituals going on. What do you mean, oh, I don't know, some rituals going I on? I mean, I saw some... I just remember seeing people in a circle with, like, dark, black, hooded robes on um, and getting quite freaked out. So, obviously, I was on a horse, so I <laughs> counted, <laughs> galloped away from them, you know. What time of night was this? Uh, I would say quite early. It doesn't make sense, really. It doesn't really make that much sense because, well, I, seven o'clock ish, maybe. I can't remember the exact time, but not late, not the kind of but time you'd be talking it's... summertime, like it is. Yeah, now. sorry, yeah, I think it was about, well, I think it would be like Midsummer Eve is the kind of time because um, that was the kind of time of year it was. I mean, I can't say for absolute fact that is when it was, that, that it would have been Midsummer's Eve, I mean, but it feels like that's when it was. And I am quite intuitive. I don't just get feelings which are random. I mean, are these druids doing some kind of... Maybe, sort of maybe, maybe. Maybe. Anything sinister? Why? Maybe, maybe there was nothing sinister to it at all. Maybe it was perfectly innocent. Maybe... Ah, there is something interesting. On Ilkley Moor, there's a place called the Twelve Apostles, and it's got a portal. I've never been there in any kind of conscious, like, state anyway. Is this anywhere near the, that BBC transmitter thing, that big tower? It's just the other side of the moors. No, I don't know. I don't know. I've never been there. It's, but it's in the village I grew up in. It's, it's part of Ilkley Moor, but it's actually... I, I grew up in Burley and Wharfdale, which is just next to Ilkley. It's, like, only, like, five minutes away. Um, and it's actually on Burley Woodhead Moor. But it's a continuation of Ilkley Moor. Um, it would have been like 10 minutes walk away from my house, I think. Maybe 15 minutes walk away. Um, and you've always liked horses? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Young girls like horses. That's an easy, yeah. Well, that's an easy question to answer. <laughs> All they've wanted to do was ride. When I was a kid, I had to do 
everything. Right, there's one thing which, which always my family have done, and that is if there was anything ever that I really genuinely was interested in or genuinely really wanted to do, then I was never allowed to do it. So when I was a kid, I had anything that you can think of, ballet, tap, modern, swimming, <sighs> piano, clarinet, violin, uh, choir, um, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but you get the picture, I'm sure. So every night I was always at these different classes all the time, constant, constant, constant. All I ever wanted to do was ride. That's all I wanted to do. They did not want me to get into horses. Now, actually, with hindsight, knowing what I know now, maybe they knew that if I started to ride, that it would change my timeline into a direction that they did not want me to go down. Why would the riding horses do that? Because they never wanted me to end up in a career with no money. And there's no money in horses. It's a fact, you know. Unless you're going to be some famous show jumper or something. You know, and so anyway, they, yeah, they always clearly said that to me. There was a few things they used to clearly say to me all the time. Well, that's just parents looking out of the door. Y- yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, um, of course. You know, it's very clever, this stuff. You talk about it and you sound crazy, insane and paranoid. What do you mean, this stuff? I mean, it's, it's done, it's designed so that if people are speaking out, they, can, they sound insane. Sim- it's but to describe that again what do you mean if speaking uh, people are speaking if you're out. talking about mind control it's so multi-layered and the design of it all it's designed so that if you do start to speak out about it you sound paranoid and delusional and I am not paranoid or delusional and I never have been but if someone's listening to me now that is what they would think they would think they well, haven't Love- really gone into it I mean what Let's let's get into this. Well, you mentioned Max Spears. Yeah. Do you want to talk about those guys now, or do you want to leave that until part two? Yeah. Well, maybe just like continue, like obviously my backgroundy bit. Yeah. Um, like when I was a kid, so I'm gonna. I was briefly like you know what I mentioned Fritz Springmeier's book. Um, he gives. He's got a book called. Oh, God, I can't think of the exact name of it, but it's How to Program an Illuminati Mind Control Slave or something like that, it's called. How do you spell that name? Which name? Oh, well, Fritz, his name. Yeah, Fritz Spong. Fritz Springmeier, S-P-R-I-N-G-M-E-I-E-R. Fritz, F-R-I-T-Z. Yeah, we can get that bit, but you've got another name there which has got a bit of an association. Oh, yeah, my grandfather. Yeah, but that's going to the super soldier thing, and let's surely not go there until right this second now. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the friend of James Casbolt, close to the Yeah, we'll get, we'll, okay. not now. Um, so, when I was just talking about his book, though, if you were to read that, um, it's got all these key points at which you have to be traumatised for the programming to work. And so if I look back on my life, at all the key moments in time that absolutely happened, like, for example, my parents split up when I was just about to turn three years old. Keep mentioning three, don't I, all the time? Crazy. Anyway, uh, when we lived in Liverpool then... Oh, and also... Uh, my lungs were meant to, I always got told my lungs were stuck together, so I had to spend a lot of time in hospital. Your lungs were stuck together? Somehow, my lungs had like... I don't, I don't understand. I can't get any information. So my lungs are often good things to have. <laughs> yeah, apparently mine was stuck together, so I had to spend a lot of time in and out of hospital. So you're saying you had lung, one, one lung? No, I'm saying that there was like loads of mucus and stuff on them. I don't know, because what I can't you? ever find out proper information. I just get told things by my family and, and This it's, is when you were born? This is like when I was a toddler not from being like born, born, I was born healthy um, I was actually two weeks late that doesn't, that's not, not usual for people, like they usually like to traumatise You were which, sorry? 
I said I was born two weeks late, apparently, which is quite unusual because usually they like to have... If you're born prematurely, it causes trauma to the newborn child. But anyway, I was born on the 23rd of September. 23rd of the 9th, 77, at 2300 hours. I don't know if there's anything in that because I don't know enough about ritualistic stuff to know if that is why I was born at that time and date. I really don't know. Um, all I know is I was born at, at 2300 hours on the 23rd of the 9th, 77. If anyone's got information, feel free to share. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah. yeah. And in other words, do you think your your birth was deliberately prolonged? Maybe, deliberate? yeah. Well, she was in hospital for that two weeks. Um, with a, yeah, I don't know. I really, I honestly don't know. You were a bit young at the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't have such good recall for that. <laughs> um, anyhow, then, so I was born, obviously. Oh yeah, I've got. There's no. I actually unplugged this, you know, so I don't really... Oh, must have, um, right, what was I saying? Well, um, we're, in, in, we're in the final few uh, minutes and ten minutes of this part, so all let, right, let's okay. your, your swiftly estab establish your, your, you as a... Uh, yeah, so really swiftly, basically, uh, my, my father, so this is my father, um, he became a social worker at the instruction of my grandfather who helped encourage him to go down that route, worked with Bernardo's for most of his career. For the first two and a half years of my life, nearly three years of my life, was apparently, oh my God, I've been told by everyone I was the most pre-planned child that they've ever, ever known of. All my family, friend, my mum's friends and stuff. All my life I've always been told that by anyone who knew my parents Does at the time. Does the planning include talking on the basis series? Sorry? Does the planning include doing this? Um, no, I don't know. But I just, I mean, they just said I was the most pre-planned, like, what most, I don't know. I mean, the whole family seems pretty planned. Yeah, it just doesn't it? Uh, anyhow, yeah. Is the phone actually off or is it they listening? No, there's, not, there's no one there. Do you really think, I hung it up. I didn't answer it, I just... Yeah. No, I was just... You're making me <laughs> stop it. I'm not paranoid, I don't know where to get me. <laughs> well, I'm not, so, anyway. Uh, you mean you're not paranoid and they are out to get you or they aren't out to get you and you are <laughs> No paranoid. one's out to get me, I'm in control of my own life now, thank you very much. You're in control of your own life now? Yes. What about when you wasn't now? Well, my, my whole life's been, a, I would say, a battle of wills for... Me, I'm a, I'm a powerful person, you know, and I would say that not so easy to mind control. Now, from those who have had problems with mind control, what you've just said is very important because it is the power and you taking control of things, which is the most positive thing to get across at this short moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody has control of their own destiny. Even if there's forces at work which are massively trying to change that, at the end of the day, if you've got it within you, everyone's got it within them to fight, if, you know. And I don't mean fight physically, I mean to stand for what's true for you. So, sometimes things happen which may seem really negative, but you can turn it around for the positive and you can see why it happened and it had to happen like that to make you into... So that you become who you are now. It's all part of your growth. Everyone has a, a reason why they're here, a part of the puzzle to fit into. Um, and for me, for anyone, you can turn things around. All you have to do is not go into victim mode, not get sucked into the fear. Really, really, that's it. Yeah, a lot of people go into victim mode. As, uh, whoever goes yeah, into why mode. me, why me? Or the fear with all these chemtrails and stuff. Um, people think they're awake because they're aware of what chemtrails are. It's just a trap to keep people stuck in fear. 
Same with the false flags, all of this stuff. It's a trap. And I think it's worse to consider yourself awake, but to be stuck in that trap of fear because you're feeding into that energetic level which they want, which they, which they get energy from. So it's really key to not get stuck. Okay, become aware, but move on, keep growing. I see so many people stuck posting picture after picture of this and that so negative it's so feeding it's doing exactly what they want you to do yeah i'm very conscious of this in the basis series that i don't want to feed the fear but knowing about something is different to feeding yeah it. yeah it's, to very... be aware yes but be aware this is tra it's a trap and all we have to do to stop all of this all of this is all to raise our own inner vibrational fields if we all raise our vibrations and don't feed into this fear, then all of that has no power. It's all an illusion. We live in, an, we do live in, we are creating this world. So if we stop feeding into the fear-based stuff, then it's no longer going to exist. It's just that simple. Well, with, with media and Hollywood, how do, you, how do you think that's overcome? With media, sorry. With media, TV, yeah. soap operas. Switch off. The news. <laughs> Why watch it? Yeah. Why? It's I mean, with this, more mind with this latest Channel 4 program, which, which trashed the Amash project, yeah. which we could talk about briefly, uh, one of the purposes of that was to trash everybody and make sure no, uh, nobody comes forward. Yeah, to keep, people, keep, to keep people trapped in fear for, because they think they'll be ridiculed if they speak out. Absolutely. Um, that was the purpose of it. Which is to, why... To conquer and divide have, as well. Which is why the people who have spoken out are so brave and we take... Oh my salute. God, yeah, absolutely. 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 Brave souls, really brave souls. Because at the end of the day, deep down, everybody knew this would end up happening. And so people put themselves on the line for the greater good. Really important. Really, really important. Special people. <laughs> well, finally, uh, just in this, to close this part, to establish you, uh, anything further you want to say in the last five minutes? Um, that needs to establish how you came here to talk to me. Where is that part two? Well, uh, I believe you asked me to talk to you. <laughs> you did, actually. Well, it's better both, you know. <laughs> um, I find you so Okay, whilst Joe... <laughs> what were you going to say, then? I find you You're so You're going to feed my ego, then? I'm going to feed your ego. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't ever have um, spoken to anything to do with no disrespect to you, because it was never you I had a problem with, but Joanne, I knew from day one that she was trouble, and I wasn't prepared to come anywhere near... So this is a very serious statement. I mean, yeah. Joanne's a very it's, lovely lady. Very no, she's, she, she enchants, enchants people. That does not mean she's lovely. It means she's absolutely the polar opposite to what she tries to portray herself to be. This she, is very serious. Yeah. Yeah, I don't say things lightly. And what would you say to the people who have been in trance, or how do they get out of it? Um, I think as soon as you become aware of what what is what has been going on around you, then it breaks the spell. Yeah, but, that's that seems to have happened because since the program, for instance, yeah. a lot of people are now happening. A lot of things are sort of coming my way in terms mm -hmm. of information. Yeah. But um, once bitten, twice shy. Not necessarily. Um, in other words, it could easily happen again. What you mean, do you mean as in? Well, I'm saying to those who have been bitten, uh, so to speak, entranced. Yeah. Uh, is it you know, I think it would make them, time, or? I think that it should make them more aware of what to spot. Now, really, just to close on this, because it's such a serious point, uh, how bad is this? The problem is... How, how bad is this? It's bad. It's really, really bad because people are, are divided by it. People are either in denial to it even existing. Uh, and yes, she is definitely reptilian. Definitely. Definitely. Now, does reptilian not, mean a bad not, thing? Not, I was just going to say, I, not that that is a bad thing, but it is bad if you're a negative entity, which she is. She's... 
not here for the greater good. She's not here to help people. She's here to further her agenda, well, their agenda. Who is they? Well, whoever she's working for. Who does she work for? Well, that's a very big question. Yeah. Well, um, in fi finally, in the last minute, uh, what would you say to the Amash people? The people who... I would say, in? stop feeding into this. Stop, stop attacking Miles, because he hasn't done anything wrong. He, he, she had him enchanted. He couldn't see that. He ha anyone who's been enchanted by her, it's not, it's not your fault. It's what she does. For those who could see and couldn't speak out at the time, because people... You would have thought that we were trying to conquer and divide your group. And so... It was impossible. You just had to wait until the time was right to be able to speak on this level about it. Because, oh, awful situation, awful. Okay, well, but awful is what's kicking off now. And the fighting and all this stuff, it needs to stop. Because it's still, she's, she is controlling this completely. She's sitting back and she's watching this and it's playing right into her hand. Has to stop. People have got to move on. It has to stop, break the spell. Well, I'm thinking of using this little section as on, in isolation. This yeah. This is a quick warning. So uh, I'm very grateful that you've um, said that about myself, but some people would argue I'm just putting you up to this to say this. What would you say about that? I don't get put up to do anything. All I'm going to, well, listen. I, I, I know that putting myself in a situation in this interview is not something that I would want to do for reasons... I mean, why would you want to speak when you know you're going to get a load of crap for it, basically? But for the greater good of the world and for humanity's awareness and because I really want people to get over the fear and stop feeding into it, that is why I'm doing this. And I'm sick of seeing you get attacked I'm sick of seeing the group fall apart. And I'm sick of seeing everyone turn on one another. It's just breaks my heart. I can't stand it. And that is why I'm speaking out. So. Okay, well, thank you very much on this. This <laughs> closes uh, Basis 29 Part 1. And okay. this is the little clip for YouTube. So, one people have